Hey everybody, good to see you. Yeah, I think I went to church here until I was like, and my mom's here so I can ask, seven years old? Yeah, six and a half, something like that. Um, and I remember like, if you were here when the tornado hit the building, like how many of you were going here when that happened? Some of you are like, what do you mean? Yeah, okay, so you have to tell that story later. Um, and then we went over to the uh, Fett Square, is that what it was, and met one of the buildings I don't know. Maybe not. Okay, thank you. I, I'm going to need a lot of help, so you have to head nod, you know, wave your hands, things like that. But I'm honored to be here. Uh, I came with my wife, Catherine, um, and we've been married for four years this past May, and she's a teacher in Smyrna, Tennessee, which is about 30 minutes north of where we live in Murfreesboro, and we're really thankful to be here tonight. So if you want to go ahead and turn your Bibles to John chapter 3, that's where we're going to start out. We won't be there the entire time, but we will be in the book of John the entire time. So either it's on your phone or your, uh, or your Bible, whatever. Just take some time to turn there and then we'll get started. So while you're turning there, um, this lesson, just the direction it's going to go, made me think about the first time that Catherine and I went to the grocery store as a married couple. And maybe you have a memory like this, uh, like where you went and did something for the first time together, married couple. And so Catherine and I went to Kroger up in Murfreesboro, and uh, we had our meal planned for the week. And the first meal we ever made, we took a picture of it. I don't have it on here. We took a picture of it because we were so excited as a married couple, we were going to make tacos. And I think it was on a Tuesday maybe, so we had Taco Tuesday. We got all our stuff together. We got the meat, uh, lettuce, whatever you get for your tacos, everybody's different. I do not like refried beans, so we didn't pick those up. But we got to the salsa aisle, and this was our first disagreement. Which salsa do we pick? And so her family had always used something that was really bad, and my family had always used, uh, my family had always used Ortega. And so um, I remember standing there in the aisle, and she picks up the bottle, and she puts it, like the bottle of her family's weird stuff, you know, and she puts it in the, in the buggy, and I think to myself, no, <laughs> we're not going to use that, are we? And so I get the Ortega, and I put it in there with it, and she looks at me and like, that's not what we use. I'm like, well, it is now. <laughs> you know, we, we just go back and forth. And so we kept talking about this, and, and it wasn't really an argument. It was our first disagreement because it was like a time where two traditions finally came together for the first time. Like maybe you've had that experience when you got married, or maybe when your two families interacted for the first time. You had two traditions meet each other, and that moment for us was like the first time in our married life where two traditions collided. And so in case you're wondering, we do still use Ortega, but we compromise. So there you go. <laughs> if you're using anything different, don't tell me because I will convince you. Um, but but our, our traditions collided. And, and I want to start out by saying that traditions are a great thing. They really are. You have family traditions that you have at every holiday, every Christmas, maybe every birthday, where you do certain things and your family's getting together and you've done this for decades. Maybe it's been in your family for a long time. I know people have ways about like they unwrap presents and some people do like maybe a few presents on New, uh, the Christmas Eve, and then some people do it the next day. Catherine's family opens pajamas on Christmas Eve. I never did that. Uh, I, I didn't never wore pajamas, so anyways, that's a whole other story. But, um, yeah, I can get weird up here. But, so, uh, and then we have cultural traditions as Americans, you know, things that we do, celebrate the 4th of July, all these different things that we do. Other countries, Catherine and I were able to travel out of the country this year to Africa. We got to witness a lot of their traditions and the things that they do. And so, it's a beautiful thing when people get to celebrate their traditions, because within people's traditions, you get to find out a lot about their identity. And you get to see where people come from and why they do certain things and why their families do certain things and why they celebrate. And so when it gets to a point where traditions have to end or traditions maybe have to change or maybe you have to break a certain rhythm of traditions that you've done in the past, it can be a really hard thing. And I want to start this message by saying, for better or for worse, churches and people that go to church can be where tradition is held on to most tightly sometimes. And I said for better or for worse, because sometimes tradition can be a very good thing in churches. Sometimes it can be a very hard thing. And so it doesn't matter which denomination you're a part of or expression of worship that you come from. We're in a Church of Christ tonight. 
I was raised Church of Christ my entire life, and I still work for one today. But if you're visiting from a Baptist church, or a Church of God, or a community church, or a house church, whatever expression it is, I can almost guarantee whatever kind of church expression you're a part of, you have some kind of tradition that your church or denomination has carried on for years and years. Now, maybe you don't go to church at all. Maybe you're a person that maybe this is the first time that you've ever stepped into a church, and you're like, what is he talking about? I have good news. You can sit back and judge all the Christians here, because this is <laughs> mostly about Christians. But um, I, I can guarantee your church has traditions wherever you are, and, and they've had that for a long time, maybe decades, maybe centuries, maybe for even longer than that. They've had it for a very, very long time. And, there, and there's points where, where things come into tension um, when, when traditions are met. And so if you have been part of a church for a long time or um, maybe a short amount of time, uh, there comes a time where your traditions in your church Maybe that's come already, or maybe it's happening right now, or maybe in the future. There comes a time where the traditions of your church and the truth of Jesus meet one another. And oftentimes, not every time, but often, when that happens, it causes conflict within you. It can cause conflict in your family. It can definitely cause conflict in your church family. And it might even cause conflict in your relationship with God when Jesus' truth shows up in the midst of your religious traditions. So tonight, as we look at the story of Nicodemus, we're going to witness a moment when the truth of Jesus and the tradition of man meet, but we're going to see together how something really beautiful can come out of it. So John 3, that's where we're going to start out. If I'm preaching, I guess I need to turn there too. Um, we're going to start in verse 1 of John chapter 3. It says, Now there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know you're a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the signs you are doing if God were not with him. So real quick, I want to explain Nicodemus. Maybe this is the first time you've heard about this guy. He was a Pharisee, which means he was a pretty legalistic kind of Jew. He kept the law, and he expected other people around him to keep the law of the Jews too. And he was also a member of the Jewish ruling council, which was called the Sanhedrin, which was made up of about 70 men who kind of like set precedent for the law of Jewish people. And so when people were acting out of line, or, or, or maybe imagine like America's Supreme Court. It was the equivalent of that. Like when, when somebody got out of line or when there was a major court case or when somebody messed up in the religion in some way, if it was really serious, it would go to these people. It would go to the Sanhedrin. And so imagine this man, Nicodemus, who has a lot of respect and he carries a lot of weight. People looked at him as a teacher. People looked at him as a rabbi. People looked at him as somebody that could really change the trajectory of their entire lives if they got in trouble. And so he carried a lot of pull. And like most people in the area that we're reading about right now, he had heard of this teacher. He heard of this rabbi named Jesus who had had been healing people. He had been casting out demons. He had been setting people free. He had been turning water into wine. Like you imagine somebody that was doing all these things and you're on this board really of other people who are religious leaders. And it's something that you'd raise your eyebrows at. So imagine you're in Nicodemus' situation and for a while, maybe on Instagram, Facebook, you've heard about somebody that's just been doing all these incredible and wonderful and amazing things and they come to Tuscaloosa. Like you'd probably want to go see that. You would wonder about it. You would get curious about it. And so Nicodemus was kind of in the same place. He wanted to go see what all the hype was about. But it was conflicting because if he went and saw Jesus and other people saw that, it would really hurt his reputation. And so you have to really take in consideration where Nicodemus was at. Imagine being in his shoes. He worked hard to get where he was. I mean, there was a lot of Jewish rabbis. There was a lot of people who studied the law for their entire lives. And there was only 70 men on this council. So he worked a long and hard time to try to get where he was. He was a religious leader, so a lot of people followed him. He was highly respected. And now comes a point where he has the question, you know, do I go hang out with Jesus? Do I spend time with him? Because all the other people that I worked so hard to be around in the Sanhedrin, if they find out about this, my reputation is at stake, and maybe even my position on this Jewish council is at stake. And so he had a lot to lose. And the fact that he was Sanhedrin, and the fact that he's a Pharisee is very important, because he knew the Old Testament like the back of his hand. This is important to our study. He knew it like the back of his hand, and probably more than likely had the thing all memorized. So imagine like taking that much of your Bible and having it all memorized. Like this was that guy. And so he knew the law like the back of his hand. He probably thought about it day and night. He had memorized these things. He sung it over his children. He sung it to his wife. Every Friday night during Shabbat, they would uh, sing these passages over each other and, and quote these scriptures. And so he loved the Old Testament. He loved the law. He loved the prophets. He loved all these things. 
And as a person in his position, he would have known that all of these prophecies in the Old Testament about this man from Nazareth, which was a prophecy, that was born in Bethlehem, which was also a prophecy, and that, that this person, all these prophetic things that had happened hundreds of years before in the Old Testament, through, spoken to the prophets, he would have known that, that a man from Nazareth that was born in Bethlehem, this was lining up with the prophecy that he had always heard about. And now he's healing people? Now he's opening blind people's eyes. Now he's going to paralyze men. And now they're walking from a simple touch and from a simple prayer. And so he's asking himself the question, could this be the King of the Jews? Could this be the Messiah that we've been waiting for for hundreds of years? And I imagine he was excited. And so he came at night, wondering, hoping that this could be the guy that they finally were looking for. And so look what he says in verse 2. He says, you've come from God. And no one could be doing these things if they weren't from God. And so, in Nicodemus' mind, like he understands that Jesus is somebody that isn't just an ordinary teacher. He's not just an ordinary guy. He's not just another dude that's on the street just saying some kind of random things and trying to start heresy. He's not this kind of guy. He's somebody that has power from God, and he's somebody that is doing amazing things. And so, as Nicodemus like, looks at the Old Testament, he looks at all these prophetic words and things that prophets have talked about hundreds of years before, imagine like he has a checkbox. Okay, he has to be born, this, the king of the Jews, the Messiah that's coming. He has to, the, the first, he has to be able to, to have been born in Bethlehem, so that's got the, that's got the checkbox. He's got to be from Nazareth, so that's got the checkbox. He's got to be able to heal people, and he's checking these things off. And finally, if all these check marks work out, boom, you got the king of the Jews. you got the Messiah sitting in front of you. Um, and, and so he came at night to ask Jesus questions to continue exploring this possibility, to keep checking the boxes off his list to see if this could be the guy. So imagine like the excitement in this guy. Like a, imagine if you knew that there was going to be a king that was going to bring you freedom, there was going to be justice, there was going to be power, all of your enemies would be destroyed, and you've waited on this person for four or five hundred years. That was Nicodemus' situation. He had been waiting on this person. The Jewish people had been waiting on this person for hundreds of years. And Nicodemus, in his mind, thinks to himself, I could finally be sitting in front of this guy right now. And that's the situation to set the scene for you. And look how Jesus responds to him in verse 3. He says, Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. How can someone be born when they're old? Nicodemus asked. Surely they can't enter into the, a second time into their mother's womb to be born. Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they're born of water and the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to Spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying that you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from um, or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. How can this be? Nicodemus asked. You're Israel's teacher, Jesus said, and you don't understand these things? Very truly, I tell you, we speak of what we know, and we testify to what we've seen, but, you, but still you people do not accept our testimony. I've spoken to you of earthly things, and you don't believe. How will you be able to believe, how will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? And so that's, that's a long section of verses, and we don't have time to unpack all that. I'm not even going to try. But what I do want you to notice is that Jesus kind of gets straight to it. Like if Jesus was a boxer, he'd go punch the guy right in the mouth first thing. It's just like kind of how he was. He, he was a heavy hitter. He would hit back. And, and, and so many times in the Gospels, like when Jesus, uh, only three times out of all the Gospels, Jesus answers a question directly. And this is one of those times. Every other time he asks a question back. And so he's challenging Nicodemus because he's not only the king of the Jews, he's also uh, the, the king of challenging people. He's like the king of controversy. He'll bring up hard subjects. He'll challenge people in a constructive way to get them thinking. And this is what he's doing right here. Because he wanted to challenge Nicodemus to see if Nicodemus would accept the truth that he was preaching out to him. He wanted to know if Nicodemus would line up all that he had learned in the Old Testament and all that was in front of him and see if he would finally come to believe in Jesus. And now Nicodemus' tradition was to keep the law. He was supposed to meet the requirements of the Old Testament law. And so think about, like for time's sake, I don't want to do all the do's and don'ts because there's like over 300 of them. But imagine like you have a list in front of you of things you can do as a follower of God and things you can't do as a follower of God. And if you don't do all those things right, if you fulfill the requirements of the law, you'll finally end up in heaven. Like that's kind of the way that they thought about these things. And there were other sacrifices and things they'd have to do. But for his entire life, his idea was, I have to be good enough in order to make it to heaven. I've got to meet all these requirements of the law. But the problem was, uh, for Nicodemus and all these other people, 
It wasn't that they followed the law, because the law wasn't bad. I want you to understand that. That the law was given by God to the Jewish people in order to know how to live from wrong and right. God is the one that had given them the law, so the law is a good thing. But what the issue was with Nicodemus and the Pharisees and the Sanhedrin is that they had taken the law and they had idolized it so much that they didn't allow anything new to come in. And so they made the law their own traditions in different ways, so much so that the law blinded them, and the traditions that they set up blinded them. And so anything else that tried to come inside of that bubble, it wasn't, wasn't going to be allowed. And so they were so serious about the law that they were blind to it. I want you to understand that. Because I don't want you to walk away and think to yourself, oh, Jesus is against the law, because that's not the case. Jesus gave the law, and Jesus came to fulfill the law and the prophets. The way he was against was the way they had traditionalized the law and looked down on other people who didn't do the same things they did. That's a very important thing. And this is important for Nicodemus because he's not just representing himself. It's not just about the individual that's in front of Jesus, but because of his position with the Sanhedrin, because of his representation of the Jewish people, he, he was representing the entire nation of Israel because he was a spokesman for Israel. So imagine it's not just Jesus who he's trying to break through with in this conversation. It's all of Israel. It's all the Jewish people because he was the top guy. He's one of the top men that was there. And so him accepting Jesus with open gates for for more Jewish people to come to know God. So this was a very, very important conversation. So I'll tell you a story really quick um, because we see Jesus talking to Nicodemus and now these traditions are trying to cause some tension. So um, a long time ago... uh, some friends and I, when we were in high school, got together this um, thing called CIA. It was Christians in Action. And basically, I didn't come up with it. Some of my friends came up with it. Um, but I was like the, the little preacher boy. And so they, they knew how to get the, the stuff together to make it happen. And what we were going to do, our whole idea was to host a worship night for the high school here at FET. And so it was going to be hosted at another, I'm not going to say names, but it was going to be hosted at another church here. This is really hard for me not to say names, you know, it's like, Maybe you'll say it. If I say it, then we have to wipe the whole video and everything else. But um, we were going to host a worship night at another church here. And, and we like invited everybody we possibly could at our high school. And so it was like on a Thursday night, and we handed out flyers, we hyped it up, we put it all over social media, and, and they got the, the worship band together, they got um, the people that were going to receive people and, and just pray for them through struggles and challenges. They got everything they needed together, my friends did, for this worship night to happen. And they said, Ben, we want you to speak at it, because we don't know anybody else that's 15 or 16 year old that enjoys speaking, so we do that. And I said, yeah, for sure. And so about this same time, I was scheduled to speak at another church in the, in the area uh, for, for like a Father's Day sermon. And so they had planned this months in advance for me to come in their church and to speak and like to give this presentation and all this other stuff. And so the Sunday after this worship night that we were having, I was supposed to go speak at this church. And, and so we do the worship night. It's amazing. Like over 100 kids from the high school show up. My friends did a great job just from promoting it and getting it material. I didn't do anything. I just showed up and I, did a, I gave a terrible sermon. <laughs> And, and so, but like after that, students started coming forward from the high school and just like confessing sin and, and just saying things that were on their heart. And it was really a beautiful moment. And it was so cool because during our time at high school, we'd never seen anything like that. Where students just came and want to be part of a worship service. And there were kids there that didn't even go to church. They were lost. And they came just because they wanted to be a part of something that other Christians at the high school were doing. And it was like a really a beautiful moment. And so that happens. We all cry and hug good night. And the next day I get a phone call from the church that I'm supposed to preach at. And so they call me in. They say, hey, Ben, we got some questions for you. I'm like, oh, man. Okay, so we go, we go in, and they're asking questions. They're saying, you know, what would you do? What would you do? And before, I, like, I knew that I was going to be questioned about all these things. I knew that there was going to be, like, kind of like a, a time where I was going to get hammered with some questions and things like that. So um, from the Scriptures, I worked along with uh, somebody else that I trust to basically give three reasons from Scripture why this would be okay. Like there were lost people there, like there was nothing wrong, things like that. And so um, we go to the meeting, and there's questions asked. And so I have my three verses prepared to kind of defend myself while this is okay. Before I even open my Bible, they pull out a sheet of paper, and they say, hey, we have three verses we want to we tell you about. I was like, okay. And they name every verse that I'd already put down on a piece of paper. And they said, hey, you did a great job doing this. You did a great job doing this. And we agree with everything that you did. Like, it was a beautiful thing. It was so good. And um, 
and we think it all lines up with Scripture. It's like, oh, okay, maybe this is going a better direction than I thought it would be. And I said, but we still don't agree with it. <laughs> like, what? <laughs> so I was like, oh my goodness. And, and so I walked out of that thinking like, you agree with everything that happened. You agreed with the Scriptures that you brought up, not even me, to say that this was all okay. But then you say, but we still don't agree with it. It was just kind of a crazy time. And I left that just thinking to myself, like, like I, w I was 16 at the time, and, and thankfully I had like a good mom and a good dad and people that surrounded me that really encouraged me in a moment like that. But to do that to somebody so young could really be detrimental to somebody's faith if they were in a different position. And it was like, looking back on that, it was, it was, it was a hard moment then, but also just a, 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 a weird moment now. But what I remember now from that moment, and in so many moments like that, as I've been walking along this journey in and, 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 and church and things like that, is that unbiblical un traditions can, can keep you and others from experiencing all that God has for you. Unbiblical traditions can keep you and the other people around you from really experiencing everything that God wants to give you. Like, it's amazing how much we can put our traditions and our church expressions in other people. Like, I can't tell you for how long I thought it was borderline sinful for you not to wear khakis to church. Like, for such a long time. I don't know if you felt that way. And, my, you know, it wasn't my parents. It was just other preachers and things. And I thought I was going to hell if I didn't wear khakis. And the first time I wore blue jeans, I was scared out of my mind. Look at me now, you know. <laughs> and so it was just like a different thing. And, and, and then, like, I thought you were on a one-way trip to hell if you missed a Sunday. Like, if you didn't go to church, Church, oh my goodness, like the devil's got a special place for you. And so like there were so many traditions growing up where I thought these things were, were wrong. And so even for a large part of my life, I questioned whether or not my friends that went to other churches were going to make it to heaven or not. And it scared me all the time. And I spent a lot of days trying to argue with people and trying to do things and, and for so long. But then I started to read my Bible which is a very dangerous thing to do when it comes to traditions. And it really uncovered so many things for me. And if I could go back to high school now, if I could go step back into where I was, I would have spent a lot more time learning from my, friend, learning from my friends who love Jesus with all their heart. I would have spent a lot more time sitting at the feet of other people, learning how they worship Jesus, learning about their expressions of worship, so I could grow in my faith too. I would have spent a lot less time trying to convince them of things that I thought was true, trying to convince them of, of, of the right way of doing things. And, and instead, I would go back and encourage them in their faith and work with them to reach the people at our school who didn't know anything about Jesus, who didn't follow Jesus at all. But instead, unfortunately, I spent a lot of time trying to convince people that my way was the right way. Because so long people told me that that was what I was supposed to do. And I'm sure like in a room like this tonight that I could sit here with many of you and we could name tradition after tra tradition. And I have no doubt that some of, this, that some of us in the room could discuss things all night and agree about some things and disagree about some things. But the reality is, and this is what I want to break through to you tonight. The reality is, is that when unbiblical traditions hinder our walk with Jesus or even turn others away from Jesus, it's a problem that needs to be dealt with. And it needs to be dealt with every time. We need to ask ourselves, is holding on to traditions more important than our personal walk with Jesus? Or is it more important than your family's relationship with Jesus? Or is it more important than lost people coming to know Jesus? Because there's a lot of traditions that we make for ourselves. There's a lot of traditions that have come out of, of different church expressions and things like that that really hinder our walk with Jesus, our family's walk with Jesus, and other people around us walk with Jesus too. And we have to come to a place to ask ourselves, is it really worth holding on to? Is it really worth holding on to? Because I want to leave you with this before we move on. Who will suffer for your decision to choose tradition over truth? Will it be you? Will it be your family? Will it be your co-workers? Will it be the other people in the places that you live? Because when you choose to choose tradition over the truth of Jesus, sometime or every time somebody gets hurt. It hurts somebody somewhere all the time. I remember like in those days where I believed so many things that weren't true, but they were tradition. Like, for example, like wearing khakis to church, it sounds funny, but really, like there would be people that would call and say, hey, I want to come over this weekend. Can I spend the night with you? And I hated saying this, but they were like, hey, but do you have a pair of khakis? Like, I mean, I, like it sounds really funny. But, but I really thought, but, but, I, but I knew if they didn't wear the khakis, I mean, it sounds so funny, but I knew if they didn't wear that, that somebody in the church was going to judge them. And it's just like, man, how far did we go? And, and, and there's so many traditions, I'm sure we can name so many, but we have to realize that if we hold on more tightly to our traditions, 
and miss the truth of Jesus, then we're not only doing ourselves um, wrong, but we're doing so many other people around us wrong too. And this is what Nicodemus is finding out. So we're going to continue progressing to the life of uh, Nicodemus. So go to John chapter 7. And to kind of set this passage up for you in John chapter 7, it'll be around verse 45, that's where we're going to start. But to set this passage up to you, I'm going to tell you what Jesus has been doing before this. He's been healing people again, like He always is. He's been setting people free from demons. He's been opening blind eyes. He's been doing amazing things. And He's not doing anything wrong. He's blessing the community that He's going to. And He's helping them experience an expression of the kingdom of God. And He's helping them experience God loves. And so He's sharing messages that are changing people's hearts. And people are starting to love one another. Like, what Jesus was doing was a really good thing. And most of the time he wasn't even preaching against other people. He was just, just preaching the truth that God told him to preach. And so people are coming to love God and people are coming to believe in God and people's families are being reunited. I mean, imagine this great revival that is happening while Jesus is physically here on earth during this time. Like So many wonderful things are happening. And during the midst of this, the Sanhedrin, the very group that Nicodemus is a part of, they decide to go send some guards to arrest Jesus because of all those bad things he's doing. And so look at verse 45. It says, finally the temple guards went back to the chief priests and the Pharisees who asked them, why didn't you bring him in? So they were supposed to go and arrest Jesus and bring him back for all these bad things he was doing. He says, no one ever spoke the way this man does, the guards replied. And so they're talking to the Sanhedrin and they say, yeah, we went to go arrest him, but man, have you heard his messages? Like, they're so good. <laughs> like, they totally failed what they did. And then in verse 47, they say, you mean he's deceived you also? Have any of the rulers of the Pharisees believed in him? No. But this mob that knows nothing of the law, there's no curse on them, or there's a curse on them. And then Nicodemus, who had gone to Jesus earlier, and who was one of their own number, asked, Does our law condemn a man without first hearing him to find out what he's been doing? And they replied, Are you from Galilee too? Look into it, and you'll find that the prophet does not come out of Galilee. And so they go, they try to arrest Jesus for doing all this wonderful stuff. It's just so ironic to me that they start doing this. But, but I want you to notice, since we're looking at Nicodemus, I want you to notice the transition that Nicodemus is making. Like this is maybe months after, maybe weeks after, when Nicodemus first visited Jesus. And now there's an issue with the Sanhedrin. Remember, this group that he's worked his entire life probably to be a part of. There's this issue with Jesus. And they're all arguing about it, and they're all getting upset at the guards because the guards didn't arrest him. And so they're all on the same page. And then Nicodemus... Nicodemus, who had met with Jesus maybe a few weeks, a few months earlier, who's been thinking about these words, who's been thinking about his encounter with Jesus, steps up and says, whoa, 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 but is it really that bad? Is it really that bad? I mean, think about this. Like, what should, should we really, like, condemn a man who hasn't been to trial? And, and I don't want you to notice his words as much as his interjection. That he is willing to stand up in front of a group of his peers who don't agree with him at all and say, hey, maybe we need to give this guy a chance. Maybe we shouldn't be so quick to judge. Maybe we shouldn't be so quick to condemn. And so imagine the faith that it took for Nicodemus to have this transition because just a few chapters before that we looked at, Nicodemus was visiting Jesus in nighttime so that nobody could see him, but now he's stepped up and his faith in Jesus has grown. He's telling everybody that maybe we should give this Jesus guy a chance. He's not trying to hide it anymore. And so I want you to notice as we walk through John how Nicodemus' faith is growing. He's starting to think about what Jesus has said. He's starting to look at the Old Testament, look at the Scriptures, look at the Law, and compare them with everything that Jesus is doing, and compare them with everything that Jesus is saying. And the beautiful thing is his faith is growing. And he's starting to believe. And it moves from worshiping Jesus, or maybe talking to Jesus in private, to now standing up for Him in public. And so it's a beautiful transition that's happening in, in, his, in his place. But the thing that happens, as you see in this passage, is that all the Jewish leaders now turn on Nicodemus. At the last passage, they say, oh, are you from Galilee too? Are you one of those guys too? Are you one of those people that's starting to believe in him? And so now they're all turning against Nicodemus. And so when it comes to tradition, this is the second point about tradition, breaking tradition always changes your relationships with other people that are involved in that tradition. It always does. When you try to leave a tradition that other people around you are a part of, you will always get hurt. And that's the unfortunate truth about it, but it is so true. A few weeks ago, Catherine and I were in a marriage class at uh, North Boulevard where they invite different couples in to talk about just their experience in church and what they've learned over the past few years. And so um, there was this one woman and her husband who came in, and their presentation that day was over raising children. And so they taught us about, you know, all the scary things about raising children, all the beautiful things about raising children. But 
um, one thing that they brought up that um, was really the most powerful point was about the first year they got married and how their, what happened during their Christmas traditions. And so they said um, that the first year it was okay. We traveled to, to West Tennessee about three hours away and we visited everybody. We went to mom's house. We went to grandmother's house. We went to the other grandparents' house. We went to her house. And then we went to everybody's house. You know, it's like, because that's how traditions are and, and the Christmas stuff. And so the next year they had kids. And they said, and the, and the family expected us to keep the traditions again. And so we loaded up the kids in the car. I think they had one by this time. We loaded up the kid in the car and we went to West Tennessee. And we went to mom's house and dad's house. And then we went to his parents' house. And then we went to great grandma's house. And the other set of grandparents' house. And he said, by the time of it, like we were in such a bad fight. We were arguing so much. It was just terrible. He said, it made us fight. It made the kid have to listen to us fight. He said, it was just so bad. But the next year, when Christmas came around, we decided we were going to set up some boundaries. And we weren't going to visit everybody in their mama's house. We were just going to stay at our house. And so they said, they, they, like six months before Christmas, they sat down, they wrote out a document, and they said something like, Dear family, we just want you to know that we won't be visiting everybody else's house for Christmas this year, but we will have refreshments and whatever else, and you're more than welcome to come visit ours. They sent that letter out. Some of their family members didn't talk to them for two years. <laughs> Crazy, huh? So, is that what I have to do with them? No, I'm kidding. So, <laughs> no, and, and, and so, but she kept talking, she kept telling that story, and she said, but we have never made a better decision for our family. Because the kids got to experience Christmas with their family, they got to see mom and dad love each other on Christmas, they got to open parents with their other siblings. And they said, even though it was hard, even though we had to step away from the tradition that our family always done, did, we received a blessing because it helped us out on the other side. And so leaving traditions, again, sometimes is a, is, a, is a really hard thing to do. But there is a lot of blessings when you come out of traditions that really aren't healthy for you or even aren't right in the first place. And, and leaving unbiblical traditions for the sake of following what you see as true in Scripture is always worth it because God always blesses obedience. He always blesses obedience. Even if it doesn't look like in the beginning, God will always bless the steps we take in obedience for Him. And if we're being honest, because all of you, I imagine, in some way, whether it's in church or whether it's your job or family, in some way, you've had to step up to some kind of tradition that somebody else around you has set. And it's a very hard thing to do. And if we're being honest with one another, the fear of man is a very challenging thing to overcome. When other people are asking questions about you, when, you, when you're thinking about what do other people think about me, when you're thinking everybody in the world disagrees with you, when Satan's throwing lies against you and trying to make you believe things that aren't true, it's a very, very challenging thing to overcome. And, and when you have a different opinion than the majority, it's always going to be challenging. But if we want to be people that's obedient to God, we have to care more about the approval of God than we do about the applause of man. Every single time, no matter what it costs us and no matter what the relationship it causes us either. And so in this moment, for Nicodemus is a very, very powerful moment because it's a moment of freedom for him. It's not just him standing up and, and just bashing all of his friends and saying so many bad things against them or saying, hey, you, all of you guys are wrong. We don't see that here, but instead it's a moment of boldness. It's a moment of freedom where Nicodemus can step into something he's believed for a while and finally proclaim it to everybody else. And it's a beautiful thing. And then turn to John 19. We'll end up with this. This is the last passage about Nicodemus and John. John 19, verses 38, that's where we're going to start. So before this passage, just to give you some more context in this passage, Jesus has died, He's been flogged, He's been killed. The Sanhedrin, the Pharisees, they got their way. They killed the author of life, they killed the Savior of the world, they killed the Son of God, and this is where we find ourselves in this. And so I want you to notice this beautiful, uh, the next transition from Nicodemus. Look at verse 38 of John 19. It says later, after Jesus had died, after his, his body had been tortured, after he'd passed away, it says later, Joseph of Arimathea asked Pilate for the body of Jesus. Now Joseph was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly because he feel, feared the Jewish leaders. Again, see how bad the Jewish leaders were. They put the fear of people in everybody. With Pilate's permission, he came and took the body away. He was accompanied by Nicodemus, the man who earlier had visited Jesus at night. Nicodemus brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds. Taking Jesus' body, the two of them wrapped it, and with the spices and the strips of linen. This was in accordance with the Jewish burial customs. 
At the place where Jesus was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb, in which no one had ever been laid. Because it was the Jewish day of preparation, and since the tomb was nearby, Jesus laid there. And so now we come to the end of John, and we come to our last passage in John about Nicodemus. Our last passage really in the Bible about Nicodemus. And what we see is somebody who has transitioned from John chapter 3, visiting Jesus at night, to now somebody who is a completely changed man, giving everything he has over to Jesus. Because I want you to remember, he was in the Sanhedrin. He was a Pharisee. He was somebody that upheld the law his entire life. One of the laws that the Pharisees had, one of the laws that Jesus or that God said for the Jew is that if you touch a dead body, you are unclean. And Jews, Pharisees, Sanhedrin do not want to be unclean. They don't want to be defiled. They don't want to have to go out of the camp away from everybody. But look what Nicodemus does. He goes and he spends all of his money. He buys like 75 pounds worth of these perfumes and things, which is a ton of money, hundreds, thousands of dollars. And he goes and he touches Jesus' dead body and he wraps Jesus' dead bodies up, and he puts Jesus' dead body in a tomb, and he goes off and gets away from everybody else because now he can't be around anybody. Now everybody knows he's touched a dead person. And so in this moment, what I want you to realize is that now, in this moment in Nicodemus' life, he's given up everything. He's decided to abandon the traditions of his law in order to take care of the body of who he, held, who he now knows as the Savior of the world. And so look at the transformation in this guy's life. Like at the beginning, it was like, man, I don't even want to be seen with you in the daylight. But you challenged me. You grew my faith, and now I'm a different person. And I'm forsaking everything so that I can honor you, so that I can serve you. And, and what I see is at this point in Nicodemus' life, it really just didn't matter anymore. Everything he had worked for, all the things that he had remembered, all the, all the things that he had grown up doing, all the traditions he had set in place. Like since that first conversation with Jesus, Nicodemus had thought about these words. He thought about the kindness of Jesus. He kept hearing about the miracles and the goodness and the life-giving water that Jesus was giving everybody. And he had made up his mind that now this Jesus, who he first had questions about, was worth leaving his traditions for. He was worth leaving everything for. And who knows now how many other Jews Nicodemus brought along with him. All of his students, all of his people, he would go and now tell about Jesus. He would proclaim that, hey, this guy was the real deal. He was somebody. And then there's probably nobody on earth happier than three days later when Jesus came out of the tomb. Because now, after going through all these traditions in the law, after having all these things, after, after having been ridiculed by his peers in the Sanhedrin, Jesus comes out of the grave, and I'm sure Nicodemus was one of the first persons worshiping him. Showing him, proclaiming him, that this is the person that we've waited for for so long. And so before um, we end like a story like this, I want you to understand that, that what I'm saying, it, um, that, that the freedom that Jesus gives us apart from tradition doesn't give anybody permission to go and just put other people on blast. <laughs> like, like to go and just rip people apart. And to, like, I'm not encouraging you to everybody to leave and like go to your church Sunday and say, here's my two weeks notice. You know, like, like nothing like that. Like I don't, I don't want you to say like, oh man, I'm against tradition, I'm against church. But instead, like Nicodemus, we need to be people that search the Scriptures and think and pray and see if the truth of Scripture actually lines up with the traditions that we've always believed in. Because if we don't, we can be so guilty of following something that man has put in place instead of what God has put in place. And I do not want to stand in front of God and say, I was, I was more afraid of man than I, than, than I cared more about following you. I feared what other people would think about me instead of following you with all my heart. We need to be people that, that no matter what happens, no matter what anybody says, no matter what anybody else thinks about us, we follow truth regardless of whatever happens to us. And the church today in America needs people who looks at the teachings of Jesus, who looks at the teachings of God, who searches the Old Testament and the New Testament and finds these truths and says, I don't care what happens to me here on earth, I will do anything for my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I will walk out in obedience, in faithful obedience, even if it means death, because I'm willing to lay everything on the line for Jesus Christ. America needs that today. The world needs that today. And Nicodemus became somebody who he decided that's who he was going to be. No matter what his peers thought about him, no matter what his family thought about him, he was going to be somebody that obeyed Jesus no matter what happened to him. You need to be the person that says that if Jesus said it's true, I'm doing it and I'm not going to apologize for it. It's a hard place to be, but it's a place worthy to be. 
That's a place that Jesus asks of us and, and expects of us. He says, if you love me, you'll obey my commands. You'll put away everything else and you will love me and you'll obey me and you will follow me till death. And so this is a lot. I mean, it really is from, from your traditions, my traditions, from the things we think about. Like the story of Nicodemus it isn't, isn't just a man who had a change of heart. It's a man that stood up to a lot of things, who stood up in bravery to a lot of things. Um, so I want to pray for, for all of us as a group. Um, for boldness to, to do the things that we need to do, to be pursuers of truth no matter what, and, and to really not have the fear of man in us, but instead have the freedom of Christ, because that's what we need. So let's pray together. Father, thank you so much for, for this church. Thank you so much for what you're doing in this church, God, for this community. Lord, I thank you for every soul that is here tonight, Lord. Um, above all things, God, I pray that you would work in our hearts and in our spirits to help us glorify you in the way that you're deserving of, God. Lord, you are deserving of all the glory. You are deserving of all the honor. You are deserving of everything that we could give you, Father. And we pray that you would help us by the power of your Holy Spirit to do just that. God, I pray that you would give an increase in, in, in obedience here at this church, Father. That you would reveal to us so many new things here at this church and all the surrounding churches and all the churches in America, Father. That you would reveal to us things that you want us to do. And that you would help us, with, with no apology, go out and do those things, Lord. God, I pray against the fear of man. I reject that in the name of Jesus. I, I pray against all the lies from the enemy in the name of Jesus. Lord, I pray against the spirit of religion. I pray against the spirit of tradition, Father, in the name of Jesus. And I pray against Satan and all of his schemes against this church and against the people in this church right now in the name of Jesus. Father, instead, I pray that you would give us a spirit of freedom, that you would release more of your spirit in us, God, to be the people that we need to be outside of these walls, Lord. That you would help us to see lost people and hurt for them. That you would help us to give up tradition of man and pursue truth that we find in you, Jesus, in order to see people's lives change. God, we thank you for Nicodemus. We thank you for his testimony. Jesus, we thank you for not being afraid to challenge people here on earth. We know that you're God, Lord, but still you sat in front of other men, other powerful men, and you challenged them, and it broke through their heart, God. I pray that you would give us the boldness to do exactly that, that you would help us to step in front of people, that you would help us to, to go in front of leaders and, and, and to, to poor people and to rich people and, and, and to, to people in politics and to people just in businesses, God, everywhere, and that you would give us the boldness to step forward and to prepare and to proclaim truth, God, in order for you to be honored. Lord, I pray um, also for forgiveness, God, uh, that you would help anybody in this church right now who feels any kind of resentment or um, any, any hard feelings toward any church or any, toward any, towards any other leaders in church, God. I pray that you would just help us to forgive anybody who has hurt us in the past. I pray that you would help us to forgive uh, even churches that maybe we've held a grudge against before, Father. I pray that we won't care about those things, Lord. I pray that instead you will help us to only care about the truth that we find in you, Jesus. That we, we can forgive people, that we won't be afraid of other men, but instead we will want to honor and glorify you with everything that we have, Father. Holy Spirit, I pray that you send uh, more of yourself on this church, more of yourself on this county, God. I pray for a revival in Fed, Alabama. I pray for all the people that are wrapped up in drug addictions, God. I pray for all the people that are going through abusive relationships, Lord. I pray for all the people that, that don't want to go home at night because they're afraid of, of being with their spouse or being with their mom and dad, Father. I pray against all their abusive homes and all these things, God. I pray that you would restore these places. I pray that you would redeem these places. I pray that you would heal the sick in the hospital. I pray that you would uh, do miracles here in Fett County, Alabama, Lord, in order for the world to know your great name. God, I pray that all this through the powerful, holy, and righteous name of Jesus Christ. Amen.